This is video number 13 for artificial intelligence. And uh, I'm now going to talk a bit about planning algorithms. An awful lot of what has been said so far um, casts AI problems in, in a context where essentially we're looking for a sequence of actions that we can carry out in order to achieve some goal or other. In the most basic kind of format for this sort of problem, we had intelligent search problems, but these are clearly uh, in many ways quite limited. We had a state representation where a state contains everything that's relevant about the environment. Well, that in practice may not be in itself a realistic thing to be able to do. We have actions that describe how new states are obtained from the current state in a fairly rigid way, simply as a mapping from a state to a new collection of states. We represented goals in such a way that all we really know how to do is to test a state to see whether it's a goal or not, or test a state to see how far away we estimate it is from the nearest goal. And while those kinds and while those intelligent search algorithms allowed us to look for a sequence of actions that we would consider as a plan, it only allowed us to consider individual sequences of consecutive actions in an entirely linear specified order. Now, as should be clear from the last couple of lectures on knowledge representation and reasoning, we can go beyond that uh, format, but if we use full-blown first-order logic, then the computational complexity can, as usual, uh, be a stumbling block. And while there are various intermediate points between intelligent search algorithms and full-blown knowledge representation and reasoning, they all have their own uh, limitations. And those limitations are essentially built into the way in which problems are being represented and, and thought about. And here are some examples of why, in practice, uh, in trying to construct an, an agent that can work within some environment or other, uh, the approaches that we've seen so far might come up short. If, to use a frivolous example, my aim is to find a plan uh, that allows me to go out and buy some pies, then as an initial uh, problem, I have far too many possible actions at each step um, that I could consider. Uh, from where I'm sitting right now, well, unfortunately it's a bit difficult to go out and buy some pies because uh, I'm not, strictly speaking, allowed out. But there again, it's a trip to the supermarket, so I might get away with it. But in any case, I could alternatively clean the screen of my laptop or go and have a bit of a lie down, or clean the car, or cut the grass, or you get the idea. And while a heuristic allows me to rank um, the possible states that I could get to in my initial step in solving the problem, it doesn't help me to ignore all the useless actions that don't get me anywhere near my aim of having pies. But to get at the real essence of the problem with the kinds of approaches we've seen so far, Using any of them would force me to start at my initial state and then work forward in order to achieve my goal of having pies and construct a plan from the first state forward to the goal in its entirety before I can start to do it. And in particular, it doesn't in any way allow me to break the problem down into smaller sub-problems. Now, while a rule-based system with uh, backward chaining could, of course, start from the goal and then work backwards, uh, essentially the same problem arises. It has to try and construct a plan in its entirety before I can uh, actually start to execute it, and it doesn't really present any natural way of doing a problem decomposition. So now, really, our aim is to look at how we might relax some of the requirements for these um, earlier 
search and problem solving approaches and come up with something that gives us um, more flexibility um, and at the same time allows us potentially to make the search problem easier. And there are essentially three things that we're going to change um, in order to make that feasible. The first difference between this kind of planning algorithm and the kinds of things that we've seen before is that these algorithms will use a special purpose language. And again, this is uh, quite often based on first order logic or some subset of first order logic. But the key idea is that we'll come up with some kind of uh, limited language that allows us to represent states and goals and actions. And within that, states and goals can be described by sentences, which is as you would almost certainly expect, but one of the key differences um, that we have here is that actions will be described by stating what they do and also the preconditions and the effects. And here the preconditions are simply things that we have to put in place in order to make an action possible. And the effects of an action are, well, they're a description of the effects that the action will have. So if I have a goal that includes, as one of its components, um, establishing that I have pi, and that I have an action by x with an effect have x, then we know that achieving our goal may involve an action by pi. Now, we're binding the variable x to the constant pi here um, in order to establish that by pi might be a good thing to do if we want to end up uh, showing that we have pi. In addition, by x would have preconditions that have to be in place in order to allow it to work. And they might, for example, be that we are at somewhere um, that sells x's. The second key difference is that we're going to now allow um, a planning algorithm to add actions uh, basically at any point in time between now and the goal being satisfied. We're not just going to work from the initial state in a linear sequence forward or from the goal in a linear sequence backwards, but we're going to build things up in a much more freeform manner. And that allows us to essentially introduce a form of problem decomposition. Because if I need to drive to the supermarket to get pies, I may determine that uh, a sub-goal in this process is that I have my car keys. Now, by making an important decision like that early on, you can potentially avoid uh, branching and backtracking, because you're introducing a sub-goal uh, that maybe you've established to be important where the plan to achieve that sub-goal may be considerably easier to find than the whole plan in one go. And now we have the potential to search forwards and backwards within the same problem in what is going to turn out to be um, a much more effective way uh, than within an intelligent search problem in particular. The third and final key difference is that we're going to solve the frame problem by just assuming that most things are independent of most other things. Previously, we had to specifically model elements of the environment that are not affected by um, particular actions, and we had to infer from one step in a plan to the next that certain things would remain unchanged. Now we're essentially just going to assume that if the effect of an action, or the list of effects of an action, doesn't include something, then that latter something is unaffected by the action. And that also allows us to look at the solution of problems of this kind in the terms of a divide and conquer, divided into subplans and treat each one individually kind of approach. Now it doesn't entirely give us a get out of jail free plan in terms of allowing us to treat problems by breaking them down into subproblems, because it's still possible to do that and end up with interactions between the subplans that you hadn't previously considered. But we're probably getting a bit ahead of ourselves. So let's leave that till later. 
In order to illustrate some of this material, I'm going to use the following uh, simple and, as usual, frivolous example. The intrepid little scamps in the Cambridge University Roof Climbing Society wish to attach an inflatable gorilla to the spire of a famous college. And I would like to thank whoever it was when I was a PhD student that uh, actually did this and provided the inspiration. In order to do this, they will need to leave home and obtain an inflatable gorilla from a joke shop, some rope from a hardware store, and unfortunately in this instance the poor chap having attached his gorilla has met with a bit of a mishap and needs a first aid kit. So they're going to need to obtain one of those in advance as well. And that can also be obtained from a hardware store. After they've got these things, they need to return home. So, we're going to set up uh, a planning problem to solve this problem. And uh, use that to introduce the idea of the partial order planning algorithm. So the first step here is to talk about um, the language that's used to represent problems within this context. Now this language is called STRIPS, which stands for the Stanford Research Institute Problem Solver, and goes back to 1970. And this is a fairly straightforward subset of first order logic. We represent states as conjunctions of ground literals uh, with no function symbols in them. So in this current example, our initial state is that we are at home and we don't have a gorilla and we don't have the rope and we don't have the kit. And goals are similar, but now we can have variables which are assumed to be existentially quantified. Strips represents actions using operators, and as I've already hinted, these things have a description of what they do, but also preconditions and effects. So in this case we have an action for going to some location Y. And in order to actually perform such an action, we have to initially be at uh, some location X, and there has to be a path connecting X to Y. And if those two things are in place, then we can perform the go Y action, and the effects will be that we are at Y, and we are no longer at X. And in general, we will just have here an action description, a list of preconditions that are required in order for the action to be used, and a list of effects, which are things that are true after the action has been used. And the next step involves um, making one of the, the main changes in our perspective, which is that instead of thinking in terms of constructing a sequence of actions uh, in a linear manner, we can think in terms of starting with an empty plan and modifying that plan to obtain new ones. Um, and we can modify it in quite a number of different ways. We can, for example, uh, add further constraints to it, or we can do things like adding a new action, or instantiating a variable, or imposing an ordering. Now, notice that we can add actions to a plan without necessarily specifying uh, any particular ordering among them. And then we can introduce ordering constraints at a later time. And this is one of the main um, places in which we add some flexibility into what we're doing. And that is uh, particularly significant. Okay, the relaxation of the idea that plans have to be entirely linear is quite a, a quite a big deal. Uh, and that should make sense, um, because taking a a simple example here, if you have a goal of having your shoes and socks on, and currently you don't have your shoes and socks on, um, it obviously doesn't matter to you uh, what order you solve this problem in, as long as the socks go on before the shoes. Beyond that, it doesn't matter whether you start with your left foot or your right foot. And there are a number of ways of achieving your goal uh, using a different sequence of actions. They're all entirely sensible. You can put your left sock on and then your right sock, or your right sock and your right shoe, then your left sock and then your left shoe. 
But as long as the socks go on before the shoes, you're happy. And we don't want to commit to a completely linear plan unless we absolutely have to. So one of the central ideas here is the principle of least commitment, that we don't commit to any specific choices until we have to. And that can apply both to ordering among actions and also to the instantiation of variables. Now what we'll actually end up with is a partially ordered plan, meaning that we have some actions and some constraints among them in terms of which ones have to happen before which other ones, but that in exactly the same way as we can take minimal constraints in the problem of putting our shoes and socks on, namely just that the socks have to go on before the shoes, any linearization of that kind of plan then gives us a, a suitable solution. So our plan now has a much more interesting structure than any of our previous versions of what a plan might be, which were just linear sequences of, of actions. The plan now is a set of steps, and each one of those is one of the available operators or actions. Or I'm going to call them actions um, because it, uh, it's more consistent with, with what I've been talking about up till now. We'll then have a set of ordering constraints. Now, a constraint saying that one thing, SI, has to happen before another thing, SJ, only says that it has to happen at some time before SJ. It doesn't imply that it has to happen immediately before SJ. So the notation here is hopefully quite obvious. I'm using the less than symbol to denote that something, SI, has to happen before something else, SJ. And that just means that it has to happen at some time or other. Um, but it doesn't prevent you from having other actions happening in between SI and SJ. The plan will have a collection of variable bindings, because the uh, actions or the operators that we're uh, dealing with will tend to have uninstantiated variables in them, and they will eventually need uh, to be instantiated to specific things. And finally, and um, here is a further new idea, which um, will probably not make complete sense until we've seen a little bit more of the example, is that we will introduce causal links which are sometimes also called protection intervals. So, the notation SI arrow with C over it, SJ, isn't the same thing as an ordering constraint, although it always has uh, an equivalent ordering constraint paired with it to say that SI has to come before SJ, but it's used to denote the fact that the reason for doing the action SI is that its effect sets up one of the preconditions, namely C, that's then needed in order to do action SJ. So it may be, for example, that in order to put on my right shoe, there's a precondition that I have to be wearing my right sock. I would then perhaps introduce the action of putting on my right sock in order to set up the precondition for putting on my right shoe. But that's a new thing and it's worth just mulling it over for a moment. When you see that there is a causal link from SI to SJ with condition C on it, that just means that SI is done sometime before SJ so that one of its effects sets up the precondition C, which is a precondition for SJ. So, to get this process started, we have two special steps called start and finish, and a single ordering constraint that says that the start has to happen before the finish. Nothing surprising yet. And we don't have any variable bindings, and we don't have any causal links. And along with this, while start has no preconditions, we treat it as a kind of um, action um, but one that only has effects, and its effects are the start state for the problem. 
And similarly with finish, we treat that as a kind of action, but one that has no effect, but its preconditions describe the goal. And beyond that, neither start nor finish actually does anything. Now so far we have the, the concept of an empty plan, and of actions, and of ordering constraints, and of protection intervals. The question now is, uh, what is it that we actually want to end up with? Um, given those building blocks. Well, once again, we have these words complete and consistent, and uh, now we, we can uh, apply them to partially ordered plans in a very similar way um, to how we've applied them in various other contexts. The plan is complete simply when each precondition for each step that's in the plan is achieved by another step in the plan. And what it means for a precondition to be achieved is um, something that you can probably guess. If you have a step S with a precondition C attached to it, then C is achieved for S by another step in the plan, S prime. If S prime has to happen sometime before S and C is an effect of S prime. So we're just matching up effects of earlier actions with preconditions of later actions. But where things get interesting is that we have a second condition here, which says that there is no other step in the plan which could cancel out the achievement of a precondition. Or specifically, there's no further step, S double prime, for which the ordering constraints allow S double prime to happen after S prime but before S, and where one of the effects of S double prime is the negation of C. So what we're saying is that one step of the plan sets up a precondition for another step of the plan, but no third step can happen between those two steps and cancel out the precondition. And the second property here of consistency just says that we don't have any contradictions in either the bindings for the variables or the proposed ordering. Or in other words, we never have a situation where some variable v can be assigned two different constants. And we never have a situation where we propose that a step s comes before s prime and also s prime comes before s, which makes perfect sense. So going back to the running example, we initially have only start and finish as the steps in the plan. And now the algorithm is going to work by systematically adding new steps to the plan. And it's always going to add the next step in such a way that one of the preconditions that still remains non-achieved within the plan is achieved by the step that we're adding. Now, as you will see, there may be a lot of ways of doing this. And uh, of course, all the clever stuff happens on the last bullet point here, which is that if at some point the algorithm gets stuck, we will backtrack and try an alternative. Initially, we have a situation that looks like this. We have two steps, start and finish, in our initial plan. And start has no preconditions. And its effects describe the start state, namely that we are at home. It is the case that the joke shop sells gorillas. And I hope that the abbreviations here are self-explanatory. JS for joke shop, G for gorilla. And in the start state, we know that the hardware store sells rope and that the hardware store sells first aid kits. We also have a single step finish, which has no effects and whose preconditions describe the goal that we're trying to achieve, which is that we are at home and we have a gorilla and we have a rope and we have a first aid kit. Now it is somewhat implicit in this diagram that when we're at the start, have G, have R, have FA are all false. 
I hope that beyond uh, pointing that out, the way in which um, negation works is self-explanatory here. I've tried to make the diagrams as clear as possible, so I'm not going to draw the precise state of every predicate at every possible step. In this problem, we're going to have two actions that we can apply. The first says that if we are at x and we go to y, then we will be at y and no longer at x. And the second says that if we are at x and x sells y, and we do the action by y, then we will have y. So if you look back one step, we can see that uh, there are several unachieved preconditions here, namely the ones uh, that are at finish. And the idea with the algorithm is to select one and try to introduce a step, to introduce an action, that achieves it. So if we take the have g precondition in finish, we can wonder how we can introduce an action to achieve that precondition. And as the by action has the effect have y, we can try instantiating y to be gorilla, so that the by action then achieves the have gorilla precondition for finish. And this is the essential process that we're going to use to try and fill in a working plan. Now, the uh, example that I'm about to give is one of probably quite a large number of orders in which you can go about trying to solve this problem. Um, it has been chosen this way specifically so that I have the simplest possible example that illustrates all the concepts that are needed. In reality, you might find that you do things in a different order, get stuck, and then have to backtrack and try something else. So if I do exactly as I've just suggested, and introduce a by action to achieve the have g precondition for finish, the y variable in the by action gets instantiated to g. What else have I done here? Well, I've introduced an ordering constraint that says that start has to happen before by. And I've introduced a protection interval. And I'm denoting these using thick arrows rather than thin ones to denote the fact that the by action was introduced in order to achieve the have g precondition for finish. And as I suggested earlier, a protection interval always implicitly has an ordering constraint associated with it, or as I suggest here, thick arrows denote causal links and they always have a thin arrow underneath. Now I can continue in this way, and I can now select another precondition. Having achieved have g on finish, I can select have r or have fa or at home on finish, or I can now select at x or sells xg on the by g action. Any of these will do, and I can try and achieve one and then see where it gets me. So now I'm going to select the cells xg precondition and try to achieve that. Now in this case I can achieve it without having to introduce another action. Why is that? Well one of the effects of start is cells jsg. And that immediately achieves the precondition that we're trying to achieve, namely the cells precondition here, because if we look back at the previous slide, in cells xg the g is already instantiated and it matches cells jsg in the effects of start. And x is still available, so we can bind it to js, at which point x also becomes bound to js in the at precondition of by. And we can introduce a causal link to denote the fact that start is now achieving the cells precondition for by. And we've now matched up the cells effect in start, and we've also instantiated 
the other precondition for the buy action to be at JS. What can we do now? Well, again, we can select any unsatisfied precondition that we like. So in this case, let's try and achieve the at JS precondition for the buy action. Well, we can do this by introducing a go action. And once again, if we just look back a little way at uh, the definitions for these actions, we see that uh, introducing an action go y has the effect at y. So if we introduce an action and bind y to js, then it matches the precondition at js for the buy action, and we're making progress. So having introduced go.js, we introduce a causal link to indicate the fact that it is achieving the precondition at js on the buy action. And also now we introduce an ordering constraint to say that go.js has to happen after start. Now we can continue quite happily um, with this process, um, at least in the, in the short term. Looking at this diagram again, we can achieve the at x precondition on go joke shop using the start state, because x can happily be instantiated with home at this point, and we can just introduce a causal link. That's the first bullet point here. Second suggestion here is that we can add a by R step with an associated causal link. So I can introduce a further by here by R, which achieves the precondition have R. And which once again has to happen after start. And I can add a causal link from start to buy R to achieve the cells hardware store R precondition that appears on buy R. And so this will become my causal link. But then things get interesting. Now we've got this situation, and we ask how we can make some further progress. We're now in a situation where the at h precondition on by r is not achieved. So what are we going to do? Well, the obvious thing to do then is to introduce another go action, and that's uh, that's not such a big deal. We've now achieved the at h precondition on by r by introducing a new action go hs. But then we're presented with um, a potential problem. We still have this at precondition on go hs that hasn't been achieved. And the temptation is going to be that we should try to achieve that precondition using a causal link from start um, and binding x to home. So we would be introducing a causal link over this ordering constraint, making this causal link, and this would become at home. But the problem is that this effect of the go action would then be that we are not at home. And the reason that that is a problem is that we've got this guy over here. 
Now, why is that a problem? Well, at the moment, one of these go actions can clearly happen before another. Now, let's just redraw this a little bit more neatly. Um, so we have not at home here, and we have at home here, because we've introduced a causal link to achieve at x by binding it to home, and it's start that's being used in order to do this. So this is a big arrow, a big thick arrow now, because it's a causal link. Well, the problem comes because right now, start has been used to make it possible to do GoJS by achieving the at home precondition here. However, if we do the GoHS before the GoJS, so we do this guy first, then the problem is that its effect is not at home. And so we've made it impossible now to do GoJS because its precondition here is no longer achieved. And in fact, the converse is also equally true because GoJS has the effect not at home. If we were to do GoJS first, its effect would be not at home, and it would now be impossible to do go hs because we will have negated its precondition, which is at home. So we have a potential problem here. Now, how do we how do we get around this one? Well, the technical term for when one action potentially negates the effect of another action that has been introduced in order to achieve a precondition is, uh, is that it clobbers it. And the step that may invalidate or clobber a previously achieved precondition is called a threat. And the planner can try and fix these by introducing an ordering constraint. On the left here, we have the situation uh, where there is a threat involved that we have to deal with. Here we have a step that is being used to achieve a precondition C for a later step here. But the ordering constraints, and remember the ordering constraints just denote the fact that one thing has to happen before another, allow this third step to happen in between the first and the second. So if step one happens and then step three happens and then step two happens, because the effect of step three is not C, that then makes it impossible, in fact, to do step two. And there are two ways we can try and fix this. The first is a demotion which just introduces a new ordering constraint forcing what was step three to happen before step one. So there's an ordering constraint here. And that means that this step can have its effect, not C, but this step then reinstates it. And so everyone's happy. Another way in which you can try and get around this is a promotion. And now we've introduced an ordering constraint to make sure that this step happens after this one. And so the fact that its effect is not C isn't relevant because this step has already happened. So how does that allow us to continue in our running example. Well, what we did previously, or what we suggested previously, which led to a problem, was the idea that you could achieve 
the at x precondition of go hs by using a causal link from start, okay, which is this guy here. Now, as an alternative, we could try and achieve it using a causal link from GoJS, because one of the effects of GoJS is at JS. And if we don't introduce this causal link, that means that the x in at x can be bound to JS. So that's an alternative way of achieving the at x precondition here. Now initially, you're going to want to just ignore this ordering constraint here. Okay, so to start with, just assume that that's not there. Okay. Now, what I've just suggested is that we um, don't use the start state to achieve the precondition for GoHS, but instead we introduce this causal link and achieve the precondition for GoHS using the GoJS action. So we already know that an effect of GoJS is to be at JS, and now we're using that to achieve the precondition for GoHS. Unfortunately, we're still not quite done because we fixed the earlier potential problem, but we've introduced another one of the same kind. And the problem we've introduced now is that we have not at JS as an effect of the GoHS action. And unfortunately, given the existing ordering constraints, and remember at the moment, we haven't yet introduced the thin red arrow. If we go to the joke shop and then we go to the hardware store, then the effect of going to the hardware store is that we are not at the joke shop, and that makes it impossible now to buy the gorilla. And as GoJS has a causal link having been set up specifically to make it possible to be at the joke shop and buy the gorilla, that's a problem. And there's nothing in the ordering constraints that stops that from happening. However, we can introduce the thin red arrow. And now it looks as though everything's happy. The thin red arrow corresponds to A promotion. And by promoting the Go HS action, by introducing the extra ordering constraint within red line, we now have a setup that's constrained enough that no action is threatening any other action in the sense that it has an effect that negates another action's precondition. And the extra ordering constraint has made that impossible. So now in the plan, we are forced to go to the joke shop first and then buy the gorilla. And only after both of those things have happened can we go to the hardware store. So in general, the algorithm looks like this. And initially, I'm going to simplify this a little bit and not worry about the fact that there are variables. If we've got a partially completed plan, and that means, of course, that we still have preconditions that haven't yet been achieved, the algorithm picks a precondition P associated with some action or other, B. And having picked the precondition and the action that it's associated with, it generates a set of potential new plans. And to generate that set, we note that 
But you can either achieve P using an action that's already in the plan, if there's an action already in the plan with a usable effect, or by adding a new action to the plan. So that gives you a whole bunch of potential new plans, either using an existing action or by introducing a new action to achieve P for B. Now we haven't quite finished yet, because some of those potential new plans may have inconsistencies that uh, don't allow us to, to keep them. So for each of those, we say that A has to come after start, A has to come before finish, and A has to come before B. And we introduce a causal link to denote the fact that A is achieving precondition P for B. Then if the plan is consistent, in the sense that it has no threats in it, we're done. Otherwise, we'll generate all the possible ways of removing any inconsistency by a promotion or a demotion, and we'll keep any of the plans for which that is successful. Now if at some point you actually get to the situation where there are no unachieved preconditions, then any plan at all that you can extract from your now completed one is fine. And by that I mean that the ordering conditions may be like the ones for putting on your shoes and socks, and that you can linearize the plan in any way you like. Now enforcing consistency itself has some level of complexity. You would first find all the causal links in the plan that A now clobbers, because A now achieves a precondition P, so if it can feasibly happen between some action A prime and B prime, where A prime sets up not P, you're going to need to try and fix this by introducing one of the two possible ordering constraints for a promotion or a demotion into the plan. And you're also going to have to do the converse of this, which is to find all the actions C in the plan that clobber the causal link that you just introduced and try promotion or demotion to fix those. And once again, you would try all the combinations and keep the ones which are successful in the sense that you remove any threats. Now we do still need to deal with variables, and now we have a further potential um, tricky situation in that because actions can have multiple effects, it's possible that you will introduce an action with an effect like not at x. And the question then arises of whether or not that's a threat to a precondition at js, where x is instantiated. Now that's called a possible threat, and you can deal with it by introducing inequality constraints, in this case by saying that x cannot be bound to JS. So now every partially completed plan that you generate has a set of inequality constraints associated with it, and each will have the form that says that the variable V can't be equal to X, where X can be either another variable or a constant. And whenever we try and make a substitution work, we check our collection of inequality constraints to make sure that it won't introduce an actual conflict. And then if we would introduce a, an, an actual conflict, we would discard that partially completed plan as a possibility. Now as a final point for this video, I'm going to um, introduce a thought into your heads, and it's this. There have been numerous points in earlier lectures where we've been performing some kind of search and there has been a suggestion that by making the choice of where to search next we may actually make the overall search process more efficient either by trying to direct ourselves towards a goal or by trying to force a situation quickly where we will backtrack and try an alternative. 
These possibilities have usually shown up whenever there's a choice to be made. And now we're introducing choices in the way that this algorithm executes. So for example, here, one of the first things we do is select a precondition, and then we consider continuing our planning process either by using an existing action or by introducing a new one. So we have potential places at which we can order things, hopefully to our advantage. And hopefully you've guessed where this is going. We can now talk about introducing heuristics into the partial order planning algorithm. So that's what we're going to look at next.